the first time I ever met Kobe Bryant, my life changed forever. See, back in 2007, Nike flew me out to Los Angeles to work the first ever Kobe Bryant Skills Academy. Nike brought in the top high school and college players from around the country for an intense three-day mini camp with the best player in the world. And for any of you that don't follow basketball as closely as I do, just know that in 2007, Kobe was the best player in the game. Well, an important fact about me is basketball was my first identifiable passion. I fell in love with the game at five years old. And here, 40 years later, basketball is still a major pillar of my life. And having grown up around the game, I'd always heard this urban legend of how insanely intense Kobe's individual workouts were. When I found myself on his camp staff, I figured, this is my chance, this is my shot. So at my earliest opportunity, I walked up to Kobe and asked if I could watch one of his private workouts. He was incredibly gracious and smiled and said, sure man, no problem, I'm going tomorrow at four. Well, I got a little bit confused because I had just got done looking through the camp schedule and the camp schedule clearly said that the first workout with the players was the following day at 3.30. Well, Kobe recognized that confused look on my face and clarified that with, yeah, that's 4 a.m. Well, I couldn't think of a reason on why I couldn't be somewhere at four in the morning, so I'd committed myself to being there and I figured if I'm gonna be there anyway, I may as well try and impress Kobe. I may as well show him how serious of a trainer I was. So I came up with the plan to beat him to the gym. So I set my alarm for 3 a.m. The next morning, the alarm goes off, I jump up, I get myself dressed, I hop in a cab, and I head to the gym. Now when I arrive, it's 3.30 in the morning, so it is pitch black outside, and yet the moment I step out of the cab, I could see the gym light was already on. From the parking lot, I could faintly hear a ball bouncing and sneakers squeaking. I walk in the side door, Kobe's already in a full sweat. See, he was going through an intense warm-up before his official workout with his trainer started at four. Well, out of professional courtesy, I did not say anything to Kobe and I did not say anything to his trainer. I just sat down to watch. And for the first 45 minutes, I was shocked. For the first 45 minutes, I watched the best player on the planet do the most basic footwork and offensive moves. Kobe was doing stuff that I had routinely taught to middle school age players. Now don't get it twisted, this is Kobe Bryant. And he was doing everything in an unparalleled level of intensity. And he was doing everything with surgical precision. But the stuff he was doing was incredibly basic. Well his workout went on for a couple more hours and when it was over, once again, I did not say anything to him, I did not say anything to his trainer, I just quietly left. But my curiosity kept nipping away and it eventually overwhelmed me to the point that I had to know. So I went up to Kobe again later that day and said, Kobe, I don't understand. You're the best player in the world. Why are you doing such basic drills? And he flashed that million dollar smile and he gave me a friendly wink, but he said in a very serious tone, why do you think I'm the best player in the world? Because I never get bored with the basics. I never get bored with the basics. Kobe Bryant, the best player on the planet, and someone that has truly mastered his craft, said that his secret is that he never gets bored with the basics. And as obvious as that may be to you all right now, that was a life-changing moment for me. See, in that moment, I realized that just because something is basic, it doesn't mean that it's easy. Those are not synonyms, and yet people often use those words interchangeably. Just because it's basic, it doesn't mean it's easy. If it was easy, everyone else would be doing it. And you all know, in the world we live in, society is telling us that it's okay to skip steps. Society tells us we should always be looking for a shortcut or a hack. Society tells us we should be infatuated with chasing what's new and what's shiny and what's sexy and just ignore what's basic. But I'm here to tell you if you do those things, you are making a huge mistake. And that's because the basics work. They always have and they always will. And the very first step to improving performance, whether it's you improving your performance or it's you helping and empowering to improve your client's performance, the very first step is to admit that the basics work. But it's also having the humility to acknowledge that implementing the basics every single day is never, ever easy. 
as Kim mentioned, I'm very fortunate and thankful that this is my fourth fortune management event that I've been a part of and, and absolutely adore what you all represent and the way that you do it. Just by show of hands, how many of you have seen me speak live before? Is that somebody calling in to tell us that they've seen, they've seen me speak live before? Wait, put the hands up one more time. Okay, so about a third of the room. To those of you that have seen me, I'm going to tell you the exact same thing that I tell my three children. And that is just because I said it, I'm not going to assume you heard it, so I'm going to say it again. <laughs> just because I showed it, I'm not going to assume you saw it, so I'm going to show it again. And just because you know it, I'm not going to assume you do it, so I'm going to say it and I'm going to show it again and again and again. And that's because one of my foundational beliefs is that repetition is not punishment. Repetition is the oldest and most effective form of learning on the planet, and that will never change. So the core principles and values and things that you speak to your clients about on a regular basis, or the things that you talk to your own children about, you're going to have to say them again and again. But part of being communicators is making that message as sticky as possible. For those that haven't seen me live before, I'm going to tell you my goal, which is the goal of every time I take the stage, and that is to offer as much value to you as I possibly can in our short time together. See, one thing I know for certain, if you are part of the Fortune Management family, you are a high performer. You all as coaches are the Kobe Bryants of what you do. And I know that high performers are always looking to grow, always looking to improve, always looking to evolve. High performers are always looking for that edge. And that's why I'm here today, to help give you that edge. And I'm going to share some stories and some stats and some strategies. But more importantly, I'm going to give you some practical, actionable takeaways that each and every one of you can implement immediately to raise your game, which then by default you will use to raise the game of the clients you work with. Another one of my foundational beliefs is that a candle loses nothing by lighting another candle. My goal today is to light your candle so you can all go back to your respective situations and you can light the candle of the people that you work with. But in order for us to accomplish all of that in just under 90 minutes, I need you all to be open-minded to heightening clarity in three very specific areas. And a quick sidebar, as coaches and as leaders, communication is one of your most important tools to pull out of the toolbox. And it is your job is to communicate things so effectively that your message becomes sticky. It becomes memorable. It's meaningful. And it's been my experience that there's three ways we can heighten the stickiness of our message. The first is to teach through story. Story evokes visceral emotion, and we can use that to sway the behavior of our clients. So we want to teach through story. Two, we want to be incredibly concise. Trim all of the fat, trim all of the fluff, and I want you to teach in bullet points. Teach in tweets, don't teach in blogs. And three, I want you to use the magic of the, the, the number three. There's a rhythm about threes. When you teach things in threes, they become stickier, they become more memorable. So if you can do those three things consistently, your message will stick. So if you're like me and you're taking notes, anytime you see me hold up three fingers, you're gonna to wanna to write those three things down. So now, there's three areas that we want to heighten clarity. The first is our perspective. The second are our core values. And the third is our purpose. Let's start with perspective. And primarily, what is your perspective on how you view leadership? As coaches, you all by, are defini by definition are servant leaders. But what is the lens at which you look through? And I want to highly encourage you to look through the lens of transformational leadership, which is going through the world saying, it's not about me, it's about you. It's not about me, it's about you. You should be able to look every single member of your family in the eye, your spouses, your significant others, and your children, and say, it's not about me, it's about you. You all should be able to look each other in the eye while you're here in Miami and be able to look at each other, your colleagues and your coworkers and your peers, and say, it's not about me, it's about you. And you absolutely have to be able to look every single one of your clients in the eye and say, this is not about me, 
This is about you. See, when you can shift the focus off of what you want from people and turn it to what you want for people, it's an absolute game changer. And one thing I've learned in the latter part of my life, if you focus on taking, there'll never be enough. You focus on giving, you'll never run out. And something I just realized, I mean, I had this epiphanal moment while I was standing in the back of the room, because I knew that I was going to talk to you all about transformational leadership, and I knew that I was going to talk to you about it's not about me, it's about you. And then I had you watch a 75-second video about myself <laughs> and had them put a picture of me behind me while I'm speaking. So I may have to make some changes to that rhythm. But, but I do hope you realize... As I'm standing here, me being on stage, this has nothing to do with me. This has everything to do with me trying to fill your bucket and light your candle so that you can in turn do the same thing for the clients that you work with. Work, work with. So the second area that we need to heighten clarity are core values. Now one of the reasons I am so honored and thankful to continue to do work with Fortune Management is because I feel so aligned with your core values. But in addition to your professional core values, each and every one of you needs to have a personal set of core values. What do you stand for? What do you believe in? What are your non-negotiable principles? See, it's been my experience that when you can live a life based on principles and build a life based on standards as opposed to the roller coaster of emotions, you become the most magnetic person in any room. When the decisions you make are based on your values and your principles as opposed to the emotions you're feeling in the moment, you'll be much more of a consistent high performer. And don't forget that every single thing I'm sharing with you, I'm doing this because I want you all to implement this in your lives, but these are the exact same things I want you to pay forward to your clients. Tell them the exact same stuff. And the beautiful part about getting crystal clear on your core values is that it actually makes decision making so much easier, so much more fluid. Now this doesn't mean that you won't still have really hard decisions to make. You'll still have really hard decisions to make. But now with this construct, it'll actually make that process more fluid. Because you run every single decision of your life through the filter of, is this in alignment with my core values? And if the answer is yes, you do it. If the answer is no, I would at least hope you have a pause or a hesitation. The more decisions that you can make that are in alignment with your core values, then you will be on the path of where you're trying to go and who you're trying to become. So we have to get crystal clear on core values. And the third area that we want to heighten clarity is on purpose. Why do you do what you do? Why do you make the sacrifices to use your talents and your gifts to pour into others to help them improve their lives and their businesses? And don't confuse focus, excuse me, uh, function with purpose. Don't confuse function with purpose. The function of that chair is to provide somewhere for you to sit. The purpose of that chair is to provide you comfort. We want to get to the purpose, which is always going to be deeper. And the more you, as a coach, can stay connected to purpose, and the more you can get the folks that you work with to connect to their purpose and piggyback that on top of core values and having the, the perspective of looking through the lens of it's not about me, it's about you, then we've got everything in alignment. One of the best organizations that I've ever seen when it comes to purpose is DHL, the, the International Shipping and Logistics Goliath. Now, they have hundreds of thousands of team members all across the planet, and they do a brilliant job of making sure that every single one of them stays truly connected to their purpose. And their purpose is, we don't deliver brown boxes, we deliver promises. They make sure that every member of the team feels valued and appreciated and respected. They make sure that the person that's working in a, in a rural town, the graveyard shift in the warehouse loading box after box onto the truck at 2 a.m., that those folks know you are not putting a brown box on a truck. You're putting a little kid's Christmas gift on a truck. You're putting a future bride's wedding dress on a truck. We don't deliver boxes, we deliver promises. And the more they can keep their hundreds of thousands of team members connected to that purpose, then the more people will give a, the, the, the more of their people will consistently give a better effort and have a better attitude. So those are the three areas that we consistently have to heighten our clarity on. 
And when it comes to those three areas, I've never seen anyone do it better than my good friend and mentor, Jay Billis of ESPN. If you don't love college basketball as much as I do, just know that Jay Billis is the face of ESPN College Game Day. And back in December of 2010, there was a really highly anticipated game that pitted Duke versus Butler. And the reason this game was so highly anticipated were those were the two teams that met nine months previously in the national championship game, where Duke narrowly escaped with a two-point win. And it's very, very rare in college basketball that the two teams that meet on the biggest stage meet again in early December. So there was a lot of anticipation and hype around this game. Well, part of Jay's responsibility with ESPN is he watches both teams practice the day before the game. He wants to find out where their strengths lie, their keys to victory, their game plan. He wants to learn as much as he can about their personnel so he'll have plenty of fodder for the next day on air. Well, Jay, being a Duke alum, decided that he would go watch Duke practice first. And Duke was, and is for just a couple of more weeks, led by Hall of Fame coach Coach K, the all-time winningest coach in the history of college basketball. And Jay walked into the Duke practice and saw Coach K saying with great clarity, confidence, and conviction, guys, if you do what we do well and you stick to our game plan, we'll be more than fine tomorrow because we clearly have the competitive advantage. We are bigger, stronger, and more powerful than they are. We're going to pound the ball down low and get easy layups and dunks. We're going to out-rebound them, and we're going to get a, shot up, a hand up to contest every shot. If you do what we do well and you stick to our game plan, we'll be more than fine tomorrow because we clearly have a competitive advantage. And Jay left that practice and was thinking, this could be an absolute massacre tomorrow. Coach K, one of the best in the world to ever blow a, a whistle or hold a clipboard, just told his team definitively, with clarity, confidence, and conviction, what gives them the competitive advantage and where their strengths lie. But Jay had to do his due diligence, so he went to watch Butler practice. And at the time, Butler was led by Coach Brad Stevens who last year was promoted from head coach to GM and president of operations with the Boston Celtics in the NBA. And to Jay's surprise, Coach Stevens was talking to the Butler Bulldogs with the exact same level of clarity, confidence, and conviction, and said, guys, if you do what we do well and you stick to our game plan, we'll be more than fine tomorrow because we clearly have the competitive advantage. We are smaller, quicker, and faster than they are. We're going to get tons of points in transition and on fast breaks. We're going to put on a smothering full court press, and there's no way their big guys can get out to our corner shooters. If you do what we do well and you stick to our game plan, we'll be more than fine tomorrow. We clearly have the competitive advantage. And Jay left that practice and was thinking, I have no idea who's going to win this game. Both of these Hall of Fame caliber coaches have both the self-awareness and the team awareness to know what it is that they do really well, where their strengths lie, and to what gives them a competitive advantage. And my favorite part of that story is they're both correct. It's all a matter of perspective. It's all a matter on how they choose to view it. So I want you all to think of that story for a few reasons. Number one, I want you to consistently reflect and ask yourself, where do your personal strengths lie? You, as a human being and as a coach, what are your gifts? What are your talents? What are the things that you have that can add the most value to those around you and that those you care about? The second reason I want you to think of that story is you need to mine that from the, the clients that you work with. With the different dental practices you work with, what is it that makes them unique? What are their natural talents? What are things that they can take advantage of and double down on to continue to give them a competitive advantage? And the last reason I share that story with you is by the time I'm done with you this morning, I want you to feel empowered to make your self-awareness and to make your team awareness with your clients part of your secret sauce, part of that answer. That one of the reasons you all will continue to be epic at what you do is because of heightened self-awareness and heightened team awareness. So now let's unpack self-awareness. How well do you know yourself? Do you know where your strengths lie? Do you know your gifts? Do you know your talents? Do you know your hopes? Do you know your dreams? My guess is with a group like this, the answer to that is yes, 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 and yes. But I do want to challenge you. And I want to challenge you to have the courage, and it does take courage, to look on the other side of the curtain. Do you have the courage to look in the mirror and ask yourself, 
What are your weaknesses? Where are your biggest opportunities for growth? What are your personal fears? What are your insecurities? What is the baggage you bring everywhere you go? Not just in Miami, but everywhere you go, you'll bring that baggage from your past. And you gotta get crystal clear on that because all of that, both sides of that curtain, in totality, make you who you are. And the sooner you can acknowledge that and lean into that and embrace that, then the sooner you can put yourself on the path of who it is that you're trying to become. But it all starts with that self-awareness. And there are three pillars of self-awareness that we'll dive into now. The first are our habits. The second is our mindset. And the third is our focus. So let's take a look at habits. The things we do unconsciously and the things we do consistently. There was a Duke University study that found that 42% of everything we do from the moment we wake up to the moment we go to bed is habitual. That means almost half of everything we do every single day is on autopilot. We've grooved a series of behaviors, repeatable patterns that provide us comfort. And it's so important that you take a look first to be aware. Remember, you will never improve something that you're unaware of. You will never fix something you are oblivious to. So awareness and clarity are always going to be the first two steps. But you need to take a look at your habits. And I've already told you, my evaluation of you all is that you are the Kobe Bryants of the coaching world. You are the best at what you do. You all are high performers by definition. But even with that being said, I have a really, really important rhetorical question that I want you to reflect on over, your over the next couple days. And that is, are you a high performer because of your habits? Or are you a high performer in spite of your habits? If you were to break down and list a granular list of all of the things that you do repeatedly every single day, how many of those things are helping you? And how many of those things are hindering you? How many of your daily actions are taking you closer to the person that you're trying to become? And how many of them are weighing you down like an anchor? And don't even remotely be worried, by, worried about or stifled by perfection. I threw perfection out the window a long time ago. Thankfully, because I'm not anywhere close to it. But I got rid of perfection. Right now, what motivates me and inspires me is progress, especially when it comes to habits. And with that being said, please know that everything I'm sharing up here with you all, I'm not sharing from a place of mastery. I don't have all of this stuff figured out. I don't have the game of life on lock. I face the same challenges and trials and tribulations that you all do. Now, where I'm incredibly proud of the progress that I've made, especially over the last several years, is I've put myself on a path, and I like the direction that I'm going. But I haven't mastered any of this, and I don't know that anyone can master this. But we can get clear, clear, and we can get aware, and we can make tweaks. So my goal is, can I make consistently better decisions today than I did yesterday? Can I consistently make better decisions and have better habits in 2022 than I did in 2021? And even if that progress is ever so slight, and even if it's incremental, as long as I know that I'm going in the right direction, that's what matters most. And ultimately, as coaches, that's one of your number one jobs, is making sure that each and every person you work with is getting on the right path. And you don't have to worry about where you've been. You don't have to worry about the things that you've done before that maybe haven't put you on that path, because you can refocus that lens immediately to get back to where you need to go. And this all comes through habits. So here's your first homework assignment, your first actionable takeaway. And I recommend each and every one of you do this self-audit. And then equally important, I recommend that you have your clients do this exact same self-audit. And here's how it'll go. If you're, if you're analog like me, you're going to use a piece of paper and a pen, and you're going to draw a line right down the middle, a vertical line. On the left side of the paper, I want you to write down the things that fill your bucket. The activities that light you up and energize you. The things that you do that bring a smile to your face and give you confidence. These can be things for your physical well-being. Taking a yoga class or hopping on your Peloton bike or going for a jog. These can be things for your mental well-being. Reading a good book like Bernie's book, watching a, a documentary, listening to a podcast. These can be things for your emotional well-being like meditation or prayer 
or having a deep conversation with a loved one. But I want you to write down all of the things that fill your bucket. That's on the left side. Then on the right side, I want you to get really, really honest and vulnerable with yourself, and I want you to write down how you've been spending the bookends of your day over the last couple of weeks, last couple of months. How have you been spending the bookends of your day, your morning and your evening routine? Write down what have you been doing the first 60 minutes after you wake up, and what have you been doing the last 60 minutes before you go to bed. And I'm well aware that every day is not identical on the calendar. Uh, I'm sure there are some differences between your Sunday and your Wednesday. But don't forget that Duke study. Half of what you do is on autopilot. So I can promise you that half of what you do, uh, you're going to have these repeatable behaviors. I'm willing to bet that what you do most Sunday mornings, we're going to start to see a, a pattern. What you do most Wednesday evenings, we're going to start to be a, see a pattern. And I just want you to write those things down. And then to complete the self-audit, you're just going to compare the two sides of the paper, the two sets of notes. And I want you to ask yourself, again, and this takes vulnerability and humility, I want you to ask yourself, are you doing the things that you know you need to do to fill your bucket to show up as your best self? Are the things on the left side of the paper getting integrated into your morning and evening routine? And if you do this with humility, you are most likely going to start to uncover what's called a performance gap. And a performance gap is the gap between what we know we should be doing and what we're actually doing. It is literally the gap between the things on the left side of the paper that we know fill our bucket, which is, is, is priority number one as a coach. When you're in a servant leadership position, the very first thing you have to do is show up as your best self to everything you do. But we need to start making sure that the things on the left side of the paper slowly get integrated to the morning and evening routine. And don't worry about changing all of that at once. Don't try to, to devise a picture-perfect morning and evening routine. Just slowly start to take some of the things from the left side of the paper and sprinkle them in, even in 10 to 12 or 15-minute increments, into the right side. And what it'll do, it'll make sure that your bucket is full. So you have to remember, as a coach, as a servant leader, if you show up to anything as less than your best self, that is an act of selfishness. You are giving your clients less of a chance to be successful and get on the right path if you choose to show up as anything less than your best self. So I need to encourage you and hopefully empower you to make yourself a priority so that your bucket is full. That's the only way you'll have more to give others. One of my favorite concepts and quotes that's been around a lot longer than I've been breathing is you can't pour anything out of an empty cup. If your cup is empty, physically, mentally, and emotionally, you have less to give those that you serve. So we have to make sure that we prioritize our habits and we build systems and processes in our lives and in your clients' lives that allow you to show up as your best self. The second pillar of self-awareness will be mindset, which I personally believe is the biggest separator in, in life. Your mindset. What is your perspective on the world around you? How do you view the world around you? And I want to encourage you from a mindset standpoint, to adopt what I call a winner's mindset, which is simply deriving confidence and self-worth in knowing you're going to do the best you can with what you have wherever you are. That's it. Your goal needs to be to do the best you can with what you have wherever you are. And the reason I love that as a foundational principle is it eliminates a trilogy of behaviors that will undermine not only your performance and your achievement, but I know through personal experience it will also undermine your fulfillment and any sense of peace that you're looking to acquire. And that is blaming, complaining, and making excuses. I use absolutes very sparingly, but blaming, complaining, and making excuses will never, ever improve your situation or make things better. So the sooner we can eliminate or eradicate blaming, complaining, and making excuses from our own lives, then the sooner we can hold those that we coach accountable for the same behavior. See, if you expect it of others, you have to expect it of yourself. If you're going to hold your clients to a certain level of accountability and not allow them to blame, complain, or make excuse, you have to model that behavior yourself first. You have to live it before you can coach it. Has to be in that order. Can't be reversed from that. 
So we need to eliminate blaming, complaining, and making excuses, which is not easy to do. But it is basic. Remember what I said right after the Kobe story. These are very basic principles. Over the 90 minutes that I'm on stage, I don't expect anyone's head to explode because I'm not sharing anything complicated up here. Nothing I'm going to share with you today is outside of the realm of basic. But it's so important that you guys understand this. Not a single thing I'll share with you today is easy to do. None of this is easy. There's nothing easy about anything that I've shared with you so far or anything that I'll share with you in the rest of our time together. So we need to know that going into it. These are going to be challenges. So from a mindset standpoint, we're going to eliminate blaming, complaining, and making excuses. And when we do that, we're putting ourselves in the perfect position, and this is, this is one of my main focal points in my own life right now, is not allowing the outer world to dictate my inner world is not allowing circumstances and events and what people say and what people do to affect my own perspective, my mindset, my attitude, and how I show up. Very basic. There is nothing easy about that. I think we can all agree, especially over these last two years, there have been no shortage of circumstances and events that make it easy to default to blaming, complaining, and making excuses. But see, when we do that, we take ownership and accountability off of ourselves, and we deflect it and defer it to someone or something else. And you can't do that if you want to be a, a high-performing leader, and you can't do that if you want to be a, a high-performing coach. We have to hold ourselves to an extreme level of ownership and an extreme level of accountability. So we want to get, and this is, like I said, this is what I'm working on in my own life right now, is not letting these things in the outer world dictate my inner world. That has to come from me. And that will ebb and flow. That's why I told you all with great humility before, I don't have this mastered. Some days I do a pretty decent job with that. Some days I trip over my own feet, but I at least have the awareness and, and I give myself the grace and I give myself the permission to be less than perfect and to be fallible and then I just figure out quickly how to move to the next play, which is something we'll talk about in a little bit. But it's vital that we realize that every single response to every single thing that occurs in the outer world is completely up to us. So you saw in my uh, intro video, I'm a very proud father of three children. I have twin sons that'll be 12 in a couple weeks and a daughter that'll be 10. And I don't know if any of you, anyone here has twins or if anyone has younger sons, but I didn't realize it. For the, from ages five to 10, they were secretly training to be MMA fighters and cage fighters. <laughs> the boys had so much energy that it would take about 30 seconds of silence that I could hear in the other room before all of a sudden I would hear some rumbling going on. And inevitably someone would come out with tears. My son Jack, and, and, and I'm also a believer. How, how many of you have children? The vast majority. Yeah, I'm a believer as a parent. It's never too early to plant seeds. Like, the more you can plant seeds, even if at their age they can't conceptually even understand what it is that you're teaching them, keep planting those seeds. So my son Jack came out, and Luke and Jack had gotten in a little bit of a scuffle, and Jack was crying, and he said, I said, what's wrong, buddy? Why are you guys in there fighting? And he said, Luke is making me mad. Pretty decent response for, you know, I think he was around seven at the time. And I took a moment. And I said, Luke is not making you anything. You're choosing to be mad. Now, you have every right to choose that, but you're choosing to be mad. The response is completely up to you. And we had a nice sidebar conversation. And I can completely empathize and have compassion for the fact that what Luke has been doing might skew towards annoying or irritating, but it is your choice and your response. And you have to be able to control those things. Now, uh, my parenting philosophy is I want my children to embrace all of their emotions. I don't want them to suppress them. I don't want them to resist them. There's nothing wrong with feeling angry, with feeling frustrated, with feeling disappointed. You fill in the blank. They're, now, I'm not saying those are pleasant feelings. And I know that those aren't your preference. Which, quick sidebar, going back to the outer world versus the inner world, just so you guys don't think I'm insane, I'm not saying that everything that happens in the world is to my liking. I'm not saying that everything that goes on in the outer world is, to, is my preference. I'm saying that it's irrelevant. It doesn't matter what I prefer. What happens, happens, and it's up to me to choose a response to whatever happens. And that was the conversation I had with Jack. And I let him know, it is OK for you to be angry. It is not OK for you to punch your brother in the throat. <laughs> and I make sure that they understand that it is OK to feel every single emotion that you have, 
but you can't let that dictate your behavior. Another one of my foundational beliefs, our emotions are designed to inform us. They are not designed to direct us. This goes back to making sure that you're making decisions with the level-headedness of having crystal clear core values. So we have to make decisions based on principles and standards, not on the ebbs and flows of emotion. Life will be much too, too much like a roller coaster and too rocky if we do that. So we have to set standards, and those standards have to be more important than our feelings in the moment. But at that same time, we don't suppress any of those feelings. And that's something that's talked about in our household a lot, and it's something that I have to work on myself. So embrace every moment and everything that you are feeling and sit with those feelings. Do not allow the negative ones in particular to direct your behavior, especially on how you show up and how you treat others. So that's our mindset. The third pillar of self-awareness will be focus. Or what I'd rather call refocus. See, I don't know that it's realistic in today's day and age to have long, sustained, uninterrupted periods of razor sharp focus. I just don't know that we can do that. We have too many distractions bombarding us every second of every day. But what we can do is have an awareness of when we're unfocused and then quickly refocus the lens. So simply you need some type of trigger or something that is going to make you aware of the fact that your mind has wandered, that you are distracted, that you are not in the present moment. And once you can realize that, then you can quickly refocus the lens. So what do we want to refocus the lens on? Write down this acronym. This is from Lou Holtz. Well, the best I can figure out, this is from Lou Holtz, the former football coach at Notre Dame. He came up with the acronym WIN, W-I-N, and it stands for what's important now. And that's a, I mean, a almost minute by minute recalibration tool that I use for myself. At any given moment of any given day, you should be able to take a deep breath and ask yourself, Am I choosing to invest my attention in this moment to what I deem most important or what I deem most valuable? I would imagine if you were having a meeting with one of your clients, that's where your focus should be. That's where you need to be fully present. But I want to encourage you to let that go into your personal lives as well. When you're having dinner with your family at night, that should be what's most important. The folks sitting around that dinner table should be most important in that moment. So learn to invest all of your faculties, heart, mind, body, soul, everything in where you are. Which is why one of my favorite quotes, and I've heard this uh, from both, I, I don't know who first said it, I've heard it both from Nick Saban and Oprah Winfrey, so it has to be true. <laughs> and that is you have to learn how to be where your feet are. Wherever your feet are, make sure that's where your head and your heart are as well. That's actually the trigger that I use all of the time. Anytime I find that I am not fully present, I just say to myself, Alan, be where your feet are. Be where your feet are. I say it silently. I don't say it out loud. I'd be committed if I walked around the streets of Miami saying, be where your feet are, be where your feet are. But I constantly remind myself, be in the present moment. Now, a more expanded definition of being in the present moment has how many pillars do you think? Three. Yeah, of course. It has to be three. I love threes. Three pillars of being in the present moment. Number one is refocus the lens on the next play. Two is refocus the lens on what you have control over. And three, refocus the lens on the process. So let's take a look at next play. When I was in the basketball space, when I was working with players and teams regularly, one of my priorities was to get every single player to focus on the next play. Why would I want players focused on the next play? It's the only one they can do anything about. They can't do anything about the play that just happened. You just turn the ball over, it's okay, next play. You just missed a wide open layup, it's okay, next play. I know the referee didn't blow their whistle, it's okay, next play. Why do I want my players focused on the next play? There is nothing they can do about the turnover, the missed layup, or the referee's inability to make a call. There's nothing they can do about it. So they have to quickly refocus the lens on the next play. And there are so many parallels between the game of basketball and just the game of life in general. And the game of basketball, if played correctly, is usually pay, played at a pretty fast pace. Which means, as a player, if you choose, choose being the key word, if you choose to get in your feelings, 
You choose to be dejected. You choose to pout. You choose to hang your head. You choose to have bad body language after you turn the ball over, after you miss a shot, or after the referee doesn't make a call to your liking, and you choose not to sprint back on defense, there's a very good chance that the man you're guarding will score two points on the other end. And you just took a, and compounded a two-point mistake on one end and have turned it immediately into a four-point mistake. We simply can't do that, folks. Not if you, have, you want to have any attempt at not only high performance and achievement, but if you want to have any attempt at being happy and fulfilled and having a sense of inner peace, we can't compound mistakes. We're going to make plenty of mistakes. We're going to make initial mistakes all of the time. And that's why as a coach, there was never a problem with a player turning the ball over, missing a shot, or even being disappointed that the referee didn't make the call. But we can't get in the business of compounding mistakes. We need to siphon that off and quickly move to the next play. The second pillar of living in the present moment is learn to control the controllables. I'm a firm believer that there's only two things in this world that each and every one of us has 100% control over 100% of the time. And that is our own effort and our own attitude. Now I know there's, there's a lot of other things we have influence over and I don't want this to be a game of verbal semantics. I realize you can take effort and attitude, mix them together and you have preparation. Certainly you control how prepared you are when you're going to have a call or a meeting with one of your clients. I'm aware you can take effort and attitude, mix them together, and you get enthusiasm. You're certainly in control of how much enthusiasm you show up with in every single thing that you do. But those are really spokes off of the exact same wheel. It really all comes down. Do you guys hear that? Is that what they are? Have they been going on this entire time? Okay, I need to refocus the lens because I'm trying to be present with you all and I feel like someone's out here chopping the heads off of birds because this is getting, this is unbelievable. All right, if it keeps going, Fred, would you mind going out and asking the birds to please be quiet for a few minutes because I got, I got a little bit more time. Good gracious. All right, we're going we're gonna to dial that back in. Controlling the controllables. First, let's take a look at effort. I'm willing to bet that if I sat down eye to eye and shoulder to shoulder with any one of you and ask you, is giving your best effort a choice, you would say yes. And I agree completely. Working hard is a choice. But what most people don't own is there has to be another side of that coin. If working hard is a choice, that means not working hard? That's also a choice. And it can't be a choice that we make consistently if we want to be on the path, not only to high performance, but to fulfillment, inner peace, like you fill in the blank. You fill in to what it is that you're moving towards and who you're trying to become. But I can promise you, if you consistently make the choice to give less than your best effort, it's going to be a really rocky road in getting there. So we have to give the best effort that we're capable of. The second half of that is attitude. And for the most part, when it comes to attitude, I already covered that with mindset. Attitude is simply saying, I do not control everything that's going to happen around me. I control my response. And to me, that is incredibly liberating. Like, I find it really liberating that I'm not responsible for controlling the entire universe and every single thing that happens to every single one of us on a daily basis. I have nothing to do with that. So I don't spend two seconds worrying about it. All I figure out is what is my response going to be to the things that happen? And can that be a response that moves me forward and takes me closer to the man I'm trying to become? And try to limit the times I make responses that move me backward and take me further away from the man I'm trying to become. But I find it incredibly empowering that I get to choose. I have the keys to the car and I don't give them to anyone. I don't ever let anybody have the power over how I'm going to show up my mindset and my attitude. And I find that really, really liberating. So that is controlling the controllables. And when you can learn to let go of everything, I mean, I've, I've only really started to experience this on a deep level over the last several years. I mean, there's some serenity in that. There is something incredibly peaceful about saying, I don't care what happens. I'm still going to choose a response that moves me forward. And, and let me actually rephrase that. I do care what happens. I have preferences just like everybody else. I would prefer that the sun is out when we're in Miami than it's raining. That is a preference of mine. But if it rains like it did last night, that will have zero impact on how I choose to show up and how I choose to live my life. And that's the, that's the point that I, I'm hoping everybody works towards. So now let's look at the third pillar of being in the present moment, and that is learning how to focus on the process. 
Learning to detach from outcomes, which is really hard. This is one of my biggest challenges, is learning to detach from outcomes and focus on the process. Learn to love the work. Learn to love the day to day. Let the outcomes just take care of themselves. The best analogy I, I can think of is building a brick wall. Not implying any of you would be, but if you're ever tasked with building a brick wall, I suggest you don't worry about the wall. You put all of your focus on laying each and every brick with precision and care. Do the best you can to lay every brick exactly where it needs to go. Because if you lay every single brick exactly where it needs to go, guess what happens? The wall takes care of itself. You don't even have to worry about the wall. If you lay each and every brick exactly where it needs to go, the wall will take care of itself. From a sports lens, which again is where I've spent most of my life, it's doing the little things consistently every day in practice and during the game, and the scoreboard will eventually take care of itself. Now, as many commonalities and overlap as there is between basketball and business, and I know that's kind of a cliche, there are a lot of, uh, of overlap. There are also, a, there's a very stark difference. And the stark difference is, and Simon Sinek, who's one of my favorite authors and speakers, really brought this to light, which is basketball is a finite game. We have all, everybody in the world has unanimously decided that in the game of basketball, the team with the most points on the scoreboard when the final buzzer goes off is declared the winner. We've all agreed to that. In business and life, it's, it's not that concrete. It's much more abstract. It's much more evergreen. How you define success in life or business might be slightly different than how you define it. How you all define success might be different than the clients that you're working with. But we still have to get clarity on how you define success. The terminology I like to use is what does winning look like? And keep in mind, terminology is so important. I've spent my entire life in, in sports. So terms like winning and scoreboard have very positive connotations to me. That relates well to me. If it doesn't for you, then you just need to switch the terminology. Figure out another way to say the same thing. But ultimately, you have to get crystal clear on what winning looks like to you. And once you've established what winning looks like, that is your North Star. That's the input, that you, the input that you put into the GPS. This is where I'm trying to go, right here. And you want to be crystal clear about that. Once you do that, then you can start creating a process and a system for getting there. The best group that I've ever seen do this is the men's basketball program at Queens University in Charlotte, North Carolina. Now, I know I just said basketball is a finite game. We're dealing in an infinite game, but you can still draw the same parallel. And I use this exact same mindset, uh, mindset and construct in my own life and my, in my own business. Coach Bart Lundy, the head coach of the men's basketball program at Queens University, has figured out that there are four key analytics, and it's killing me it wasn't three. He had to add a fourth one in. Like, it feels awkward even holding a fourth finger up. But yes, he figured out there were four key analytics, stats in the game of basketball, that heavily influenced whether or not they won the game. The first, and for those of you that follow basketball closely, this will make sense. And for those that don't, hopefully I can connect the dots so that this is still a powerful lesson for you. The first is turnover differential. If we can have more possessions than our opponent, it gives us a better chance to win. The second is offensive rebound differential. If we can rebound our own miss, if we can take more shots than our opponent, it gives us a better chance to win. Three, free throws attempted. Per possession, the free throw is the highest percentage shot in the game of basketball. If we can take more of those than our opponent, it gives us a better chance to win. And four is three-pointers attempted. The three-pointer in college basketball is a massive weapon, and if we can take more clean looks from three than our opponent, it gives us a better chance to win. When Queen's University comes out on top in those four statistical categories, they win. 97% of their games. I'm going to say that again, because except for the person that just whistled, I don't think you guys think that's as cool as I do. <laughs> when they come out on top in those four statistical categories, they win 97% of their games. That means statistically they are almost unbeatable if they simply do those four things. So now I'll ask you lovely folks a, a rhetorical question or a series of rhetorical questions. What do you think Coach Lundy and his staff talk about remind and emphasize every single workout, every single practice, before every single game, those four things. 
Coach Lundy never talks about winning, never talks about banners, never talks about championships, never talks about trophies, because he knows if we just do these four things, the winning, the banners, the trophies, the championships, they all take care of themselves. What do you think he uses to design every single practice plan? I know you know, absolutely. Those four things. Every single thing that he does in practice is some way related to those four things. So the reason I share that with you is in your own lives and in your own coaching practices, you have to figure what winning looks like, figure out what are the, the measurable stats or analytics that will help improve your chance of getting there, and then just focus on those things. Focus on the bricks, don't focus on the wall. And then in turn, you're going to do that with the clients that you work with. With each and every one of those dental practices, what does success look like to them? What does winning look like to them? What can be measured and what can you hold them accountable to that will increase the chance that they will get there? A real life example, a fellow speaker of mine, Marcus Sheridan, who's a good friend, he's an author, before he got into speaking, um, he, he started, co-founded uh, a pool installation company and they, they install pools and he built it to a Goliath of a pool company, it was amazing. And he's a big data guy. And he loves looking, especially kind of on the back end of Google. And what he found, it was called River Pools, his company. He found that when a prospect, a prospective customer, viewed 30 or more pages of his website, they purchased the pool 85% of the time. If a prospective customer viewed less than 30 pages on their website, they purchased the pool 25% of the time. So Marcus wasn't worried about beating people over the head with all of the features and benefits of his pool company. Instead, what he tried to do was consistently post as much captivating and compelling and useful and educational and helpful content on his website. So that after you read one article, you click to watch a video. After you watch that video, you want to read a, a bulleted list. Like, he wanted to keep you on the site as long as possible. And he wanted to do so. He's not trying to, to manipulate or trick anyone. He wants to make sure his website is full of so much helpful, useful, practical information that you as a prospective pool buyer feel educated and feel comfortable and trust River Pools. So he didn't focus on selling pools. He focused on educating customers in the pool buying process. So continue to think how you can apply that to not only your work and your coaching practice, but apply that to the, the folks in the dental world that you work with as well. When it comes to self-awareness, I think the all-time king is my favorite player of all time, which is Steve Nash. And before Steve Nash became the head coach of the Brooklyn Nets, he had a Hall of Fame caliber career in his own right. He's one of the best point guards the NBA has ever seen. And back in the early 2000s, Steve Nash actually won back-to-back -back MVP titles, which puts him in very rare company in the NBA. And the first year that he won the MVP, he actually only led the NBA in two statistical categories. He led the NBA in assists, which means he liked to share the sugar, he liked to pass the pill, he liked to get other people involved, but he also led the NBA in touches. Physical touches. He led the NBA in high fives, fist bumps, and pats on the backside. Now, how could I possibly know that Steve Nash led the NBA in high fives, fist bumps, and pats on the backside? Well, it just so happens there was a research team from UC Berkeley, and they were conducting an official study because they wanted to measure if showing signs of physical enthusiasm actually led to more wins on the court. So they hired a team of researchers who watched every minute of every NBA game and made a tally mark every time a player gave a high five, a fist bump, or a pat on the backside. Well, the Phoenix Suns were so enamored with this study that they hired a full-time intern to count just for Steve Nash. Just by show of hands, how many of you have ever had a crappy entry-level job before? Yeah, can you imagine if that was your very first job? Yeah, you see this guy right here? Every time he touches one of these big, tall, sweaty guys, uh, I need you to make a tally mark. Well, in the very first game that the intern counted for Steve Nash, an NBA regulation, regular season game, the first time the intern counted, Steve Nash delivered, and I know some of you know it, 239 high fives, fist bumps, and pats on the backside. He was a furnace of human connection. 
Now, in basketball, where physicality is appropriate, it's been physiologically proven you can transfer energy to another human being through physical touch. A well-placed high five or a well-placed hug, you can actually transfer energy to another human being. Just to make sure I'm clear, in both CDC and HR compliant, I'm not telling you guys at the end of a client meeting that you're going to pat them on the backside before they leave the room. But here's what I am telling you. I mean, that's your thing. If you want to, knock yourself out. I just had to put the disclaimer up on myself. But here's what you can do. You can get creative and innovative in figuring out what are other ways that I can provide touches. What are other ways that I can fill the emotional bank account and make emotional deposits with those that I work with? Whether it's your own children, whether it's somebody else in this room, or whether it's the clients that you serve. How can you consistently fill their bucket with emotional deposits with the same ferocity of a Steve Nash giving high fives, fist bumps, and a pat on the backside? So here's your second homework assignment, if you will. This is more of a challenge than a homework assignment. And many of you, I believe, are already doing this. And I've had tremendous success with the groups that I've worked with. It's called 10 assists. And here's what you do. Every single morning when you wake up, you put 10 rubber bands on your left wrist. And every time you give an assist to someone else, maybe somebody in your family, maybe somebody a peer, maybe uh, uh, one of your clients, but every time you give an assist, you take one rubber band off of your left wrist and you put it on your right wrist. And an assist is anything you do that adds value to someone else's life that is above and beyond what you are expected to do. This is not part of your job description. This is above and beyond. And I want you to get creative and I want you to get innovative and think, man, what are some things that I can do regularly to fill someone else's bucket? Every time you do it, take one rubber band off of your left wrist and put it on your right wrist. But here's the rub. You can't go home for the night or you can't close your laptop at night, or you can't put your head on your pillow at night until all 10 rubber bands are on your right wrist. Until you know for a fact that you personally have done nothing short of 10 tangible things to add unexpected value to the lives of someone that you care about. Now, because you guys are the Kobe Bryants of what you do, because you're in fortune management, because you guys are high performers to the nth degree, I'm not even remotely concerned about your ability to dish out assists. I'm willing to bet almost every person in this room dishes out 10 assists before the morning coffee break. You're not the ones that I'm concerned with. What I want to see is do you have the type of influence and impact that can make that contagious? Can you make that contagious with your kids? Can you make that contagious with those in this room or those other colleagues and coworkers you have, those on your team? Can you make this contagious with your clients? You start getting your clients to go back to their dental practices and make sure that every single person at that dental practice, from the, the front desk receptionist to the hygienist to the dentist themselves, are intentional and purposeful about delivering assists to everyone. I mean, it's an absolute game changer. Very, very basic. I don't think I lost anyone on that. Not easy to do. Not easy to get large groups of people to be thinking about and intentional about pouring into others because I think it's in our DNA to be inherently selfish. It's in our DNA to inherently look out for ourselves and to want for ourselves. So we actually have to be really intentional about that. But if you can make 10 assists rampant with the groups that you work with, I'm just telling you, I've seen it too many times to count. Absolute game changer. Just want to make sure we're doing good on time because the balance when I'm finished with the keynote, which will be in just a few minutes, then we're going to have an open up uh, Q&A and dialogue, which is absolutely my favorite part. Uh, I had a chance in Philly uh, to speak with Shannon and the rest of her amazing team there. And that Q&A was unlike anything I've been a part of. They asked some of the most brilliant questions. So if for any reason, when we start the Q&A, if you guys don't have anything, Shannon, I need you to ask me all of the same questions that everybody asked me. Yeah, you can just stand up and just read them off just so I'm not just standing up here looking awkward. So we have to make sure we're dishing out those 10 assists. Now let's talk a little bit about team awareness. And I know each and every one of you comes from a slightly different vantage point. I don't know how big each and every one of your individual teams are, how many people you work as closely with. So if the team awareness stuff doesn't apply directly to you and your own coaching practice, this will absolutely have a massive impact on the, den uh, the dentist that you work with. And to no surprise, there are three key components to team awareness. The first is role clarity. The second is accountability. And the third is communication. Role clarity. 
Every single person on every single team, doesn't matter if it's basketball or it's a dental office, every single person needs to know their role, needs to embrace their role, and needs to star in their role to the best of their ability. Getting people to buy in and to believe in a role that is not of their choosing is one of the hardest parts of coaching. To get someone to make the personal sacrifice to make a commitment to a team and a commitment to something bigger than themselves when that's not the exact role that they would prefer or want, in my opinion, is one of the hardest parts of coaching. But everybody has to have that type of buy-in and believe in. And then everybody else on the team needs to respect, value, and appreciate everybody else's role, especially across departments. Can't be in a silo. This goes back to the 10 assists. Like go out of your way to give an assist to someone that you're not necessarily working with and working next to all of the time. This, I, and, and I'm, I'm thinking this audit will be very applicable with how you work with your coaches, but if it's not, I know for a fact that it will be with the dentists working with members of their team. And this audit is called the big three. I'm just gonna lay it out and then each and every one of you can figure out exactly where to put that puzzle piece. On a team, you're going to have positions of designated leadership. You're going to have people that report to other people. To do the big three audit, I want, let's just say that this gentleman here in the front row reports directly to me. We're gonna make time to sit down for a 15 to 20 minute one-on-one -on -one meeting, and I'm gonna have you write down, because I'm analog on just an index card and a pen that I provide, I'm gonna have you write down what you consider your three most important responsibilities. In your current position, what are the three most important duties that you need to fulfill? If you're only gonna do three things in a given day, what do you think those three things need to be? What are the three areas that you can make a maximum contribution to our team based on your strengths and the things that you bring to the table? And I want you to get crystal clear on your big three. And then because he reports to me, I'm going to take an index card and a pen and I'm going to write down what I consider his big three. What do I believe are the three most important responsibilities he has on our team? What do I think are the three most important things he needs to focus on? If he's only going to do three things in a given day, what do I want him to be doing? And based on what I know of him and his strengths, what do I believe are the three things that he can do to make a maximum contribution to our team? And then very similar to the first self-audit, we're going to compare these two sets of notes. We're going to put the index cards side by side and we're going to see how congruent we are and how much alignment there is to what you believe you need to be focused on and what I believe you need to be focused on. And it's been my experience, even the best leaders in the world can have someone that has worked for them for years on end and there's not identical alignment between those two things. This gentleman shows up every day with a great attitude and a great effort and he's slowly climbing a ladder that's not leading to the top of the building that I think it should be. Now the best part is, now that we've exposed this and we've, we've figured this gap out, look at that as a gift. To me, that's the best thing. Now we've gotten clarity between the two of us and we're gonna figure out how we can have an open and honest discussion just to make sure that before you leave today, we're only gonna have one index card. And this will be a collaboration. This is not me as the leader telling you what your three need to be. This is let's have a discussion and let you and me figure this out. But by the end of this discussion, there'll be no question of what the three most important things are. And if you can do that with every single person on the team, now we have everybody swimming or rowing in the exact same direction. We've removed a tremendous amount of friction because everybody knows exactly what it is they need to do. And now all I need you to do is every day show up and star where you are. Every single day you come in and you try and do those three things to the best of your ability. And that's certainly part of my job as the leader is to inspire, support, and encourage and empower you to do that. But again, it starts with clarity. I said it before and I'll say it again because it bears repeating. You will never fix something you're oblivious to. You will never improve something you're unaware of. So let's get back to the basics and sit down and get as much clarity as we can on exactly what it is you need to be doing. So that's our big three. Now let's take a look at accountability, the second pillar. I'll tell you lovely folks the same thing that I tell my three children all of the time. Holding someone accountable is something you do for them. It's not something you do to them. I tell my kids the reason I hold you accountable is because I love you. And I want to hold you to the highest standard of excellence possible. I'm a firm believer that's what a good parent does, a good teacher, a good coach, a good friend, a good spouse, a good trainer. You fill in the blank. 
If you care about somebody, you hold them to the highest standard of excellence. Now, you do so with compassion. You do so with empathy. You do so and try and speak their love language. You do everything you can to bring out the best in them, but you don't let them slide. That's why I think accountability is the best gift you can give another human being. Because ultimately, you're saying, you're better than what you're showing me right now. And I care so much about you and I care so much about us that I'm not going to let you slide. I'm going to hold you to the highest standard possible. So accountability is crucial. But before we can hold someone accountable, we need to make sure we're on the same page to what we're holding them accountable to. Very similar to what I just told you a moment ago, you can't hold someone accountable to something they're oblivious to. Going back to my own three children. So I'm very amicably divorced, so I only have my children half of the time. And I had my kids over for dinner. This was, this was a little while ago, but I had my kids over for dinner. And at the end of dinner, I asked my son, Luke, to clean the table. And after he rolled his eyes, Luke grabbed the plates and the utensils and the glasses, and he threw them in the sink, and he sprinted off to his room to start playing on his iPhone. And I was a little frustrated. That's not how I define cleaning the table. See, I define cleaning the table as taking the plates and the utensils and the glasses, coming over to the sink, rinsing them out and using the scrubber, lining them up neatly in the dishwasher, taking a Clorox wipe, wiping the table down, and if you knocked any crumbs on the ground, you sweep them up. That's how I define cleaning the table. But before I could get frustrated with Luke, I started to laugh. The failure was on me. This wasn't Luke's fault. I didn't communicate effectively and I did not articulate my definition of cleaning the table. I left it ambiguous. I left it up to him. I left it to default. And I don't know if any of you have an 11 year old son, but if you do, you can probably agree his default definition of cleaning the table is pretty on par with how an 11 year old sees the world. So then I brought all three kids out and I gave them a tutorial 101 on exactly how we clean the table. <laughs> And guess what? It's never been a problem since. Now when I say clean the table, there's no ambiguity. They know exactly what I mean when I say clean the table. And if there's ever a time, and it still happens, that they don't live up to the standard and don't do exactly what it is that I just said, because I love them, I call them out. I bring them back out from their room and do whatever it is they were deficient in. And they do it and they know. And now there's no rebuke because they understand. That's the standard we've set. That's the precedent we've set. And I didn't live up to it. So then it's my obligation, in this case as their father, but as a leader, to hold them to that standard. And the best part is, once you've gotten clarity on all of this, every single behavior that someone on a team exhibits can only fall into two buckets, one of two buckets. It's either something you accept or it's something you correct. That's it. After we're done having dinner and, clean, and whichever child I assign to clean the table, there's only two things possible. Either you did this correctly or you did this incorrectly. There is no gray area. In this case, I actually love that it's binary. Now, if it is done correctly, and when you see someone on a team doing behavior that is in alignment with your core values and your mission and your vision, you need to praise it and you need to acknowledge it because that which gets praised gets repeated. If someone on a team does not do what the standard is and does not live up to the core values or the vision or mission, then you have to care enough to correct it. Or in your cases, coach it. To be able to let them know this is not the way we do things and we need to coach them to higher performance. But every single thing we do, we either accept it or we correct it. Now let's talk about communication. And then I'll put a big bow tie on this and then we'll get some hopefully some wonderful dialogue and some, some Q&A going. When it comes to communication, you just have to realize you are always communicating something. Always. Even when you're not speaking, you're communicating something. Over the course of the last hour plus, every single one of you has been communicating a message to me based on your eye contact, facial expressions, posture, body language. Even the birds out there have been communicating something. I, I, don't, I don't know exactly what. I'm not fluent in bird, but they're communicating something. But more important than that, than, than those nonverbals, is there's an unconscious message that goes underneath every single thing that we attempt to communicate. And I just want to make sure that you guys are aware of that and that you own those unconscious messages. One of the best examples I know of is delegation. When you delegate something of importance to someone else, whether it's one of your children or it's somebody on your team, when you delegate something of importance, you send an unconscious message that I trust you. I believe in you. I know you're good enough to get this done. That is a very powerful unconscious message that will actually strengthen your relationship with that person. 
However, and this happens a lot with high performers, and I have so much empathy and compassion for this, but lots of times we delegate something and then we micromanage it. We either literally or figuratively stand over their shoulder, breathing down their neck, watching them cross every T and dot every I. And what's the unconscious message when we micromanage? Yeah, it's the exact opposite of what I just shared. I don't trust you. I don't believe in you. I don't think you're good enough to get this done. And I know that's not what you mean. I know that's not what you intend, but that is what they receive. One of the earliest coaching maxims I ever had was, it's not what you say, it's what they hear. That's all that matters. And what they're going to hear is, they don't trust me, they don't believe in me, they don't think I'm good enough. And that will erode your unconscious relationship with that person. It's like pulling a thread out of a sweater. So we have to make sure that we are owning the unconscious messages. What's the unconscious message you send to someone when you are fully present with them? In the moment, no phones, eye contact, heart, mind, body, and soul. When you are fully present with another human being, what's the unconscious message you send them? Yeah, you're important to me. I value you. I'm about to make a deposit of one of, if not arguably, the most important currency I have, which is my attention in the present moment, and I'm going to invest that in you right now. That's an unconscious message. And we need to make sure we are making that investment, that one in particular, as often as possible. Um, when it comes to communication and when it comes to these different pillars of team awareness, whether it's role clarity or accountability, Coach K does it as well as anyone that I've ever seen in my entire life. How many of you watched the, the final game or saw any of the coverage on him? All right, so we don't have a lot of basketball fans. That's all right. <laughs> well, I had a chance to meet Coach K. Uh, back when I was working at Montrose Christian. I was working at Montrose Christian as the performance coach. Uh, it's where Kevin Durant graduated from, and we've had some really good players. And I had a chance to talk to Coach K for just a few minutes before practice one day. And this was a really, really big deal to me at the time, because he was someone that I had idolized my entire coaching career. And the funny part is, even though we had this conversation, to this day, I still don't remember a single word that either one of us said. I wasn't near as present or grounded or aware then as I'd like to believe I am now, because I really don't remember anything that he said. But I'll never forget how he made me feel. He was fully present the entire time. He made great eye contact, had a warm smile, very open body language. He showed a genuine curiosity in asking me question after question. Now, I was raised old school. I was raised that when someone goes out of their way to do something nice for you, you handwrite them a thank you note which, by the way, is an absolute lost art. And I think every successive year that goes by, we see fewer and fewer handwritten thank you notes. If you want to find a way to separate yourself and to make a deposit into another human being, get back to the practice or get to the practice of handwriting notes. And the reason I bring that up is I handwrote him a thank you note telling him how amazing it was to meet him and how much I enjoyed our conversation. Well, three weeks later, I get a note back from Coach K. And I know you guys can't see this because it's dark and you're sitting kind of far away, but it's just a few sentences on the front of his stationery that in essence said the same thing. No, Alan, it was nice to meet you. Love the work that you're doing. Always rooting for you, Coach K. How long do you think it took him to write this, even if he's slow? <laughs> Maybe 60 seconds? I mean, how long does it take to write three sentences on the front of an index card? Maybe 60 seconds? Maybe two minutes? Can we agree that over the span of our entire lives, 60 seconds is a little thing? Yeah. Well, this little thing had a profound impact on my life. This little thing is why I wake up every day with an attitude of gratitude and the singular goal of telling as many people as I can, I appreciate you. I mean, this little thing is why I'm relentless in returning emails and voicemails and phone calls. Because I believe, and I know that I'm biased, but if the greatest coach in the history of all of team sports can make the time to handwrite me a thank you note, you better believe I can call you back. You better believe I can respond to your email. So just remember guys, as coaches and people of influence and impact, the little things you do make a huge, huge difference, especially when done consistently. Now I wanna put a big bow tie on this with one final story, and then we'll open it up to about 15 minutes of q and I told you about the Kobe Bryant Skills Academy. What I did not tell you was there was a very special college counselor that was there. Now, we had no idea he was special at the time because he didn't have the physical stature or the resume of the other college counselors, but we learned very quickly there was something about this young man that was unique, and it was palpable. The most impressive of these tells was at the end of the first workout, he tapped me on the shoulder and said, Coach, will you rebound for me? Because I don't leave the gym 
until I swish five free throws in a row. Swish five free throws in a row. For any of you that have never shot a basketball yourself, let me just tell you, that is a really, really, really high standard. A, ba a swish, by definition, is the perfect shot. It doesn't touch the rim. It doesn't touch the backboard. It gets its name from the sound it makes by going nothing but net. And this young man was not going to leave the gym until he swished five in a row, which means he could have swished four in a row, hit a little bit of the rim on the fifth one. It still went in. He'd still be mathematically perfect. He'd still be five for five, but that wasn't good enough for him. He would start over. And if memory serves, it never took him longer than 12 to 15 minutes to swish five in a row. That young man was Stephen Curry of the Golden State Warriors, who will go down in history as the greatest shooter that the game has ever seen. And it's not by accident. It's not by luck. It's not even because his dad played in the NBA. It's because he's willing to hold himself to unparalleled standards. And that's the thought that I want to leave you all with before I pass it back over to Kim and we open up the Q&A for a few minutes, that the standards that you set today and the standards that your clients set today, particularly in your self-awareness and your team awareness and everything that we've discussed, the standards you set today will determine who and where you'll be tomorrow.